I am fortunate enough to be an educator. But let me qualify. Um, I'm a graphic design educator, and I've only been doing so full time for a very short time. But like anyone who's new at anything, and as a result, sublimely overconfident, commensurate to her actual experience, I have some notes. Newbies are able to take a look at long-established institutions with fresh eyes, and my notes on education have led me back to a guiding principle that served me well throughout my entire career, and that is that the way we educate designers can and should be applied to students of all ages and interests, because they need bigger, stronger, and faster tools to navigate the content jungle. One thing I've been struck by as a new educator is just how different young people are than adults which I know is a super obvious statement, and I promise it's gonna be lit, so it's like, stay with me. I just turned 40, and I'm part of a group, and many of you are part of a group, called Digital Immigrants. And what that means is that we were born in a time before the internet. We had to learn and adapt to something that was foreign to us. I got my first email address when I was a freshman in college. So I learned up until that point in a very analog kind of way with the exception of Oregon Trail, which was dope. The, <laughs> the opposite of this is called a digital immigrant, and that obviously means that that's somebody that was born after the invention of the internet. They do not know how rotary phones work, they do not know what that little save icon on Microsoft Word means, and they have never seen a payphone in the wild. We've all seen the memes about this. Um, and when I was a kid, teachers valued intellectual curiosity. They loved the question asker. They loved the information seeker. They loved that kid that stayed behind to learn just a little bit more. But what happens when we no longer have to rely on a teacher as the sole source of the information that we seek? And what happens when we have unlimited access to that content with no structure or no context? Does it change the way we learn? Does it change the things that we value in young learners? Because I feel that it should. This is the grocery store checkout when I was a kid. Um, its visual messaging was fairly benign. You know, you, this is where batteries lived. Um, you, there are five meals that you can make for your family in under a half hour. I, I, you know, that's, that's about as far as that visual messaging got back then. This is what my seven-year-old sees at the checkout today. 30 years later, he is aggressively being asked to make a decision, to take some sort of action. He's practically being screamed at by colors and lights and movement. That's a monitor. That's a video monitor that plays little commercials. <laughs> but make no mistake, I'm not here to lambaste the internet or vilify the existence of screens. Because why? Why waste all that time screaming into the wind about how kids are looking at their phones way too much? Because the reality is that they are. And so are we. And because of that, we know that not all of the content that comes to us from that phone is designed to rot brains. But it's unfair of us to assume that kids can just separate what has value and what doesn't, because we really haven't prioritized teaching them how to do that yet. It's really easy for us to forget the journey we had to adults, to remember the ways that we learned to filter out all the noise, not just sound noise, to filter out the things that don't serve us and nurture the things that do. And we fail to remember that our path to discovery also looked a lot different. If we wanted to know something, we had to actively go and seek it. We had to bum a ride, we had to dig through a card catalog, we had to haul stacks of books. But it was the can-do spirit of nerdiness that allowed the intellectually curious to inherit the earth. That's what set apart the smart. All they needed was one PBS documentary about Robert Ballard to set them off on a wild trajectory towards becoming a marine biologist. That feeling of connecting something that's really important to you, that's a feeling that we can all remember, and it's that high of chasing that feeling of discovery that's created all these great innovators that we have today. And the source material for that was a lot different. The obscure 1960s textbook or the Encyclopedia Britannica had detailed illustrations, but no adventure, no full-color animated infographics or embedded YouTube clip. 
So we just absorbed as much information as possible and we manifested images in our imagination. This was a formula that worked for a very long time. A hundred years ago, it was estimated that the average person would read about a hundred books in their entire lifetime. And then in 2007, it was estimated that we encounter 85 pages worth of information every 5.5 minutes. So instead of unproductively yelling about these damn kids, let's try to take a look at that same scenario of discovery today and empathize, I know, gross, with the cognitive experience that kids have today. Watch that same Ballard documentary on your iPad, and you are led down a rabbit hole of Ballard content, and then you're probably led towards some deep sea adventure movies, and then maybe just adventure movies, and then maybe just movies, and then movie stars, and then gossip rags, and then reality content, and then branded reality content, and then you, tube, garbage. So what's the answer? Do we bury our heads in the sand and break out those old Britannicas? Do we shame one another off of screens, done ironically via social media, by the way? Do we move off the grid to cabins in Montana? No. First of all, there's definitely not enough cabins for everybody, so that wouldn't work at all. <laughs> but you might be asking, how do we do this? Why should we do this? I know everything I needed to know. Why do we have to go through this whole dog and pony show? To which, in true academic fashion, I have a very complicated answer that I have to tell in a very specific order for you to understand it at all. Number one, teach kids to chase feelings of intellectual positivity. And what I mean by that. Um, in teaching designers, we teach them to observe and record responses to visual stimuli. It's in this way that they are able to manifest complex emotions in their work. And when we are able to better, the, the advantageous byproduct of this, the best part of this, is that when we are better attuned to our emotional reactions, it's, it's easier to understand how the content that we see in here is feeding us. When we're able to recognize a more complex range of emotions in ourselves, we can better focus our decisions towards actively positive goals. For instance, you might say that you're tired. Well, are you hungry tired? Are you angry tired? Or are you emotionally tired? Because each of these three kinds of tired will motivate different decisions. There's a distinctly different solution to each of these three problems. I give my students an example that I hope illustrates the sort of subtleties of emotional responses. First, I ask them what it smells like at a basketball game. And they give me the answers that you would expect, rubber, sweat, but they struggle to connect with the question, so they default to the answer that they think I wanna hear. But then I ask them, what it smells like at a middle school basketball game on a Saturday afternoon at a Catholic school. Now, I feel like we can kind of all get there, right? It's like hot dog roller mixed with like teenage boy cologne, maybe a little incense thrown in there from the chapel, right? But we all, we all can smell that smell. We can all smell that smell from our childhood. And when we can better understand how these emotional triggers are happening, we can more easily seek out the content that's creating these same triggers in us. Number two, jack that algorithm. Um, this is a list of artists, creative professionals, filmmakers, designers, et cetera. Um, my colleague and I give our freshmen their very first big college research paper. And these are the list of subjects that they have to choose from. There's literally thousands of names I could have chosen from for this, but we hold it down to this very small list. Why? As any seasoned educator would hopefully agree, we choose these names because they'll set our students down a particular path in their research. If they're doing it right, Michael Beirut leads to Pentagram, but he also leads to Unimark, and then to Massimo Vignelli, and he leads to the Distill movement, and modernism, and typefaces, and so on, and so on, and so on. And this is how the internet works. It feeds you things that are like the things that you look at. So, uh, kids understand this, they absolutely do, and they understand how their internet presence follows them. Try talking to them about maintaining a social, uh, an employment-ready social media presence. Their eyes just glaze over because they've been hearing this for a super long time. But I believe that they don't yet know how to use this to their advantage. I believe that they don't yet understand how just because every click you make follows you, if you make only garbage clicks, garbage will follow you. That's what the internet will do. But if we teach them to prioritize 
cultivating, curating, and tending to their online presence, it can pretty easily be turned into a Pinterest board of information that's feeding them intellectually. Number three, the student as the curator. When design students reach the end of their education, it's often customary for them to create their own personal brand. Now, this can range from a very fancy, slick logo with like a color scheme and all this cool stuff, all the way down to just picking a beautiful typeface to set your name. So why is it that when we ask these students, they will tell you that this is probably one of the hardest projects that they work on in their entire education? It's because how do you sum yourself up in just one mark? How do you begin to bring together all of the pieces that it takes to tell your story? It's like we ask little guys what they want to be when they grow up, as if in 2020 this is an answerable question, because it's not. My seven-year-old's job title doesn't exist yet. We don't even know what it's going to be. This is just a few of the, I have a few job titles. This is what my seniors are encountering now, at this moment, as they search for jobs. Innovation evangelist. UX design alchemist. What do you major in for that? I don't know. <laughs> Happiness engineer. <laughs> yeah, sure. SVG badass. As if it wasn't hard enough for your mom to explain to people what you do, that's your title. So <laughs> have fun with that. Um, time ninja. This is getting insane, but I swear to God, these are real. These are real job titles that people advertise for. Um, retail Jedi. That was a good one, right? Retail Jedi. Um, so I added teleportation specialist because we're just making stuff up now, right? We're just like, yeah, what about flying car engineer? Cool. Yeah, sure. You can see how essential curatorial skills would become to not only start to narrow our field of choices, but to understand the what content we need to be looking at and listening to and seeing to feed into the things that we love to do, not necessarily the jobs we want to have. In teaching designers, we talk a lot about finding the value in things other people make. It's in this way that we learn to manifest complex emotions in others. Um, we learn what, how to make something moody or funny or sexy or silly. And the byproduct of this, the, the wonderful part of this, is that when you understand these small subtleties in yourself and what triggers these small subtleties, you can really easily go back and search for those triggers. So back to my sweet-faced little seven-year-old. Forces beyond my control are screaming at him everywhere he goes. And I, as his mother, I cannot throw myself in front of every screen he encounters. I'm not that fit. I would definitely hurt myself. Um, <laughs> but if sweet boy had the tools to be able to identify and reject the screaming, pretty soon us digital immigrant grown-ups would learn that the screaming isn't working and maybe rethink our strategy. As someone in the trenches these days, I've noticed something about this generation. They're more passionate than we've seen in a really long time. They care about each other a lot, and they're invested in their futures on a very broad scale. We as consumers can complain until we're blue in the face. We can chide brands that pander to the worst of us. We can deride shallow content as being a waste of our time. But wasteful content can stop being created if we teach young people to recognize and reject it. Not to reject the medium on which it is received. That bell cannot be unrung. But when they start to reject it, it will take content creators to task and force them to create content that has value or get out of the way. We may not be able to recreate the wonder that is discovering something new and amazing in the back of the stacks, but we can still teach kids to seek the feeling, to figure out what moves you, and chase it. <laughs>